Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I am Simon Owens, as most of you probably know. I want to get through a few house cleaning things before we launch into it, and then we'll just get right into the meat and potatoes of the of the session. Um, so, uh, one thing that I always try to start out with on these sessions is to remind you that you're not here to listen to me. This is a uh, kind of participatory gathering. It's so it's a place where we come to share knowledge. So the most successful office hours are always the ones where I speak the least. I love it to just shut up and let people share their expertise and and ask questions to each other and, and kind of go back and forth. So please do not hesitate to chime in, not just to ask our guest questions, but there are several people here that aren't featured guests who have very successful newsletter um, operations of their own. You have your own expertise to offer. One, like on our last session, there was this guy, Randy Gage, who came and I didn't even know he was coming. And we were talking about, you know, hosting events and stuff like that. And he had so much expertise to offer and I didn't even know he was showing up. And I'm really glad that he began speaking up and, and uh, contributing. So definitely don't hesitate. Uh, we have a chat that you can, you know, contribute questions to. Usually what I do is I'll just actually, you know, call on you uh, when you've asked a question in the chat. Um, or you can sometimes, sometimes people will just unmute their mics and uh and just start talking when there's an opportunity uh which there will uh be plenty i'm going to have my kind of own questions to kind of fill in the space uh you know in between when you guys are asking questions but i definitely would love to kind of step aside uh and let other people talk um let me take a screenshot of the room very quickly i always forget to do this because i, I want to use it in my promotional materials uh let me do that real quick. Uh, to do hours. Okay, that's done. Um, so you all notice when you join that you were on mute. Uh, try to stay on mute if, when you're not talking. Um, because uh, I'm going to be distributing the recorded video of this. And whenever someone talks, uh, the video focuses on them. So if someone is making a bunch of noise when they're unmuted and not talking, the video will keep on switching to them and it'll be very uh, distracting. So please, when you're not talking, try to stay on mute. Um, okay, of all that being said, let's talk, let's get into today's topic. Uh, it's probably not a surprise that this is one of our more well attended ones. It's it's about newsletters. This is something in terms of my own readership and audience that uh, th that my audience over indexes on. There's just so much interest in the topic of newsletters, not just from you know newsletter creators who are trying to make a full time living writing newsletters, but then all kinds of creators and businesses, whether you're on TikTok or YouTube. YouTube or or um, you have a traditional media business, and it's because of the you know the kind of backlash across uh, uh, against you know algorithmic based networks and the desire to own your audience, whether it's so that you can more but like but like more better communicate with them, or if like an algorithm suddenly you know de starts devaluing your content, or if the American government you know decides to completely ban your uh, your Net your platform completely because you're uh, you're you know run by a Chinese company. You know all these things are things that are top of mind for a lot of creators and media companies, and so what that's why there's so much interest uh, in this topic. And today I'd love to cover a lot of range of issues relating to newsletters, from growing the audience to creating really good content to monetize it. And to do so, I, I invited on uh, some featured guests. Let's run through them real quick quickly. First, we have Judd Legume. He's the founder of uh, Think Progress. It's a now defunct, but but once was an incredibly uh, influential progressive news sites. He now runs Popular Information, uh, which is one of the most popular newsletters on Substack. We have my good friend, Ernie Smith. Uh, he uh, he originally became well-known for having a really popular Tumblr account, but for the last several years, he's been running a newsletter called uh, Tedium that goes really deep on esoteric subjects. We have, uh, I think, I don't know if Ari's joined. Oh, I think I did see him join. Ari Lewis, co-founder of Payload, uh, which is a B2B newsletter about the space industry. 
Uh, we have Patrick Truesdale. He's the co-founder of The Daily Upside, which is like a finance-related uh, business newsletter with over half a million subscribers. And last but not least, we have Randy Cassingham, uh, who is kind of a legend in the newsletter space. He runs what may uh, be the oldest editorial newsletter on the internet. Uh, so that's super exciting to have someone who can speak about newsletters from such an historical um, perspective. Okay, let's jump all into it. So there are a few people who can only stay for like 45 minutes, so I definitely want to give them some time uh, to talk. But uh, to let's start with Judd. Um, so you've been operating various media companies during three distinct eras. When when you launched uh, Think Progress, the biggest traffic driver was search, and then you know extended on into the kind of social media era. And Think Progress was incredibly successful during kind of like the height of Facebook when it was sending traffic to uh, news sites. And now you operate you know, a newsletter that's, that's, even though it has a robust web presence, it's very newsletter forward. And I wonder like how, if you can speak from the perspective of how your relationship differs now with your audience compared to your think progress days when most of your traffic was coming through social media. Um, I definitely think you, you hear a lot more uh, from your audience just because I'm sending out an email to the the bulk of the audience each day. They can just reply and and share their thoughts, and many of them do. So I I am in more of um more of a dialogue uh with people, and I also think there's more of a focus uh you you know both from a on a substantive level, but then also from a business perspective, you really have to have more of a, a focus of what can you what can you write about that will get people really invested in it because ultimately you, you know you would like people to to pay for it um so that i think changes the relationship a bit a bit too versus yeah. you know a, a more of an advertising model where you're you're really trying to accumulate as much traffic as possible so to me i like it a lot better uh, honestly i like this this last version of this i think is the best one that that i've been involved in just because yeah i i i do really value the interactions with the readers and and in many cases uh readers are the ones who kind of get me started on my next my next topic i, I don't have like a really narrow focus necessarily in the newsletter but once i do find something i kind of will dig into it for for weeks or or months and it's a lot of times people reaching out to me that kind of gets me started on the next the next topic that i focus yeah. on well, I remember like when I was at U.S. News and World Report and running their Facebook page right at the height of kind of like when the Facebook flood of traffic was coming in, I was just constantly paranoid about the Facebook algorithm. And I remember being part of like this social journalism Facebook group of other social media editors. And like people were like constantly posting in there like, hey, are you noticing that like reaches down today? Is anybody else noticing that and stuff like that? It was just something that was just always top of mind. I find now as a creator, I, I do have a robust Facebook private at Facebook group, but I just don't like think about that as often. Do you feel like you like you, you, kind of a weight is off your chest in terms of knowing that, you know, whatever is happening in the social media sphere, you have this direct relationship with your audience? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I have Google Analytics set up and, and you know, they'll send me and, and Substack has some of this data too in their dashboard about, you know, how much traffic your your website gets. And w when you post something that is popular or and that moves around on social media, I will notice a spike and I can get significant traffic, but it's not something that I stress about at all. Whereas when I was operating uh, a website, you know, it's like, well, how many concurrence do you have? If I didn't have a certain number of concurrence by 10 a.m. Or, or 12 p.m., I would start getting like anxious about, like, well, what are we doing? Are we really picking up momentum? Are we missing the interesting stories today? So I think you can be um, a bit uh, more uh, strategic. You can think about where you can really add value and there's just more time um, to to invest. I mean, I write four times a week and some people say, well, how do you you know write so many newsletters per week? And it's like, well, you don't realize I, I was trying to produce you know 25 
uh, blog posts per day. So yeah. or per week to me, it seems great. You know, I feel like, I mean, obviously sometimes you wish you had more time, but I feel like I have a, a lot of time to invest. And I really, I really like that. And I think that the, the nice part about it is that taps into the business side as well, because ultimately you need like your super fans, the people who are really into it. And you're not going to get super fans unless you really do something where they're like, wow, I like this and I'm not seeing this elsewhere. Whereas to game the Facebook algorithm, you know, it was quite easy. You could just, I could just be watching Fox news. I'd be like, well, if I spend, if I, or I, you know, I had some uh, larger staff. So if I assign that out, give somebody, you know, 30 minutes to put this together, I know that this is going to take off and it's going to, you know, drive a whole bunch of traffic, which is going to be good for the site that day. And so just getting out of that hamster wheel has been very, just a, a huge relief for me um, professionally. Yeah, you know, if watching half an hour of Fox News, you're going to find something that's to, that's that's that can drive a lot of traffic yeah. uh, through through out, outrage clicking. Um, anybody, you know, if anybody has any questions for Judd, super, you know, I think he has. I'm guessing over a hundred thousand free subscribers to his newsletter. Super popular. We are going to get into the monetization side in, in a minute, uh, in a in a few minutes. But if you have any questions in the meantime, definitely uh, raise your hand or pipe into the chat. Ernie, like you know, now that since we're still on the the subject of uh, audience growth. You did something really interesting with with when you launched Tedium. You were very um, strategic in how you thought about audience growth, and you actually like formed some partnerships early on that helped you in terms of you know growing it very quickly early on. What were some What were some of the ways you thought about th that? Yeah, you know, one of the things I'll say is that when when I got started you know, the newsletter space was a, was a bit different. I mean, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't like as early as Randy, Randy was obviously, but <laughs> uh, I, I, I will say that like, you know, 2015, it was a different situation. There wasn't Substack. There wasn't like, you know, you know, there was tiny letter, but the, it didn't have like, you know, it wasn't the profile, you know, the newsletter space didn't have the profile it did. And yeah. so one of the things I, I did that helped, you know, my early growth was, I basically, you know, reached out to outlets that I thought would, you know, would just be interested in having some free content to syndicate. You know, I was writing a bunch of stuff and, you know, one of the outlets I reached out to uh, was Atlas Obscura and they basically were just like, yeah, this is really interesting. We, we'd love to run your piece. And, uh, you know, that turned into a relationship that lasted a couple of years. And then, um, you know, Vice eventually reached out to me and I ended up working with Motherboard for quite a long time. I'm, I'm actually still contributing to them to some degree, but, you know, I think that I think that as a result of kind of doing that, it sort of gave me a position where it wasn't like I was trying to like force the growth through, you know, trying to like advertise. I've, I've never actually done any advertising for tedium it's you know it's just all been organic but i kind of like it that way because i can sort of set the growth myself <laughs> yeah but it, but i think that like you know one of the things that's been really you know been really great about that is you know in, in some ways it's allowed me to kind of get the perspective of you know here's you know here's how i can f you know find new audiences here's how you know, you know, here's that, you know, like he gave me a little bit of an insight into, okay, well, I know that this worked for, you know, for, for this big site, you know, like, obviously, if I can find ways to do more of that with my content, which is very esoteric, you know, as you said, <laughs> you know, there's, there's a lot of room to do really cool stuff with it. And so your pitch was, I'm, you know, I have a good track record as creating content, you know, you probably know who I am. Um, you could, cause by the way, for people who don't know, Ernie is also his day job. He's a journalist. Um, and your pitch to them was, I will give you this content for free and maybe give you a 24 hour exclusive on it before I run it as my own newsletter. And in exchange, you have to have a paragraph at the top or the bottom encouraging people to sign up for the newsletter. Yeah, it's, it's basically what I did. I mean, I will say that. 
it was a little bit easier when uh, <laughs> there wasn't as much competition, you know, like in terms of the newsletter space. But, mm -hmm. it, you know, I, I do think that strategy, like if you can find if you can find an outlet that is of similar, uh, you know, is of similar positioning to yours, like it can it can work pretty well. Yeah. And I, I, it is something that I think a lot more you know, creators should think about like how these partnerships work. It's something that like YouTube's obviously YouTubers are really good at and they really kind of pull, you know, uh, really pioneered the idea of collaborating, collaborating with each other and sharing audience. But uh, it's something that like newsletter creators are just kind of starting to experiment with. Patrick, you par also partnered with a media company and that was, that played a humongous role in your growth, right? Um, yeah, hey, Simon, um, I did. I, I think uh, a way to start, um, I definitely arrived at the newsletter game for space a lot later than a lot of, a lot of folks on this call. Um, and I think my journey was a little bit unique because I did not have any real Twitter following or any audience of my own as I was getting started. And I was also really not interested in, in raising capital of any sort. Um, so when I started, I really had no other choice but to try to strike partnerships. So I think mine actually looked pretty similar to, to Ernie's probably. And um, how is that pitch? Because like these these people who are much bigger than we are, the, who work for these mainstream media companies and stuff like that, how do you get their attention? Like what's the, because they're they're just constantly getting pitched on stuff. So like, how did you stand out? Um, it's a good question. I, my background probably lends some credibility to what I was starting to write about on, on my very small newsletter. So I had a background in finance and I was writing about business finance and then, and investing. Um, and I had reached out to pretty much you know, all the large financial media companies. I definitely had good conversations with, with a couple, um, and yeah, basically the most entrepreneurial out of them was was the Molly Fool, and I basically was able to get their attention because they had seen newsletters as a very attractive space. They had just started advertising in a lot of the large uh, or, or a few of the large business publications. So I think they were you know, positively predisposed to be receptive to someone with at least some modicum of credibility who was interested in in making a go of it. Yeah. And the value proposition that you offered was interesting that they, you started with a trial run where they started promoting your newsletter to their email list. I think you generated like 30,000 signups in just like a six month period. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, I started my newsletter in the fall of 2019, a couple months later, the pandemic rolled around. So there was out of nowhere, a lot of people suddenly focused on uh, stock market and investing that were not. Um, so it, it ended up being perfect timing for that partnership. And I don't know the exact numbers, but within a year, certainly north of 50,000 subscribers came from the Molly Fool audience. And it was just simply because there was a, a groundswell of interest in, in this type of content. And then at that point, the Motley Fool, like the value for them is they actually invested in your company with the idea that they were possibly getting in on the next morning brew or the hustle in terms of like, you know, being on the forefront of a new media company that was launching. Yeah, I'm sure that was in, in the back of their mind. They were definitely advertising a lot in morning brew and, and the hustle for their own business. Um, and yes, yeah, as, as you said, we we struck kind of a, a trial partnership where they would you know, find a way to get people to sign up for the daily upside in their ecosystem. And I would share back the open rates, emails I was getting back from from readers. No doubt a lot of it, uh, again, just overwhelming interest in, in finance over the last three years definitely helped. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so um, that's really interesting. You know, everybody don't hesitate. We got we have a ton of expertise in here. Don't hesitate to ask questions uh, if you have any. Um, Ari, you had a really you know staying on the subject of audience growth. You had you also like Patrick started from virtually nothing. Like you didn't have like a large following when you launched your newsletter about the business of space. You had an interesting approach involving LinkedIn that I thought was really neat in terms of finding those uh, initial subscribers. Yeah, I literally 
uh, would just find people who worked in space and I had a template LinkedIn message and manually messaged all these people. So I would just add them on LinkedIn. Like I wouldn't do like a LinkedIn email. I would literally like request them, wait for them to accept and then just message as many people as possible. Um, now it works for us because like we're super niche. Like we have 16,000 subs now and we are the largest daily newsletter we're the largest newsletter in our industry so um which in like you know the consumer is like a joke it would be like nothing but in ours it's, it's the, the the largest so um um you you can you can do that i think in b2b especially in like really niche industries um just manually linkedin people and it's a good way to to get growth yeah in some aspects like you know depending on what it is like if someone were doing that to me on my niche, I would, you know, maybe market as spam or something. What was the way that you pitched it so that you felt like you were getting, you were offering them like a unique um, opportunity or value proposition? Um, so like, I think we, we live in like this newsletter bubble probably in this group, but in our industry, it's still like print magazines and like yeah. newsletters are like not really a thing. Um, I spoke to an advertiser recently who like, kind of was weary about giving us money because we didn't have a print magazine, <laughs> which which is not like a norm per se, but like kind of sums up still what we deal with. Um, and um, um, yeah, I would say like for most people, I don't even think they thought of it as spam because like the we really only have like one main competitor. Um, there's really not when it comes to the space industry, just not a lot there. So yeah. it's not like, you know, oh, I'm starting another like daily news newsletter. Like there's thousands, I'm sure. Like mm -hmm. in space, there's, we have one company called Space News. That's that's really. Yeah. So there's one thing I want to chat with you all with, but I would definitely want to start with Brandy on, on this one is, and I think this is something that there's a lot of different philosophies within the newsletter space um and it's list cleaning randy you had to you literally had to invent your own list cleaning strategies because they hadn't been invented yet because because of like the how primitive email service providers were when you launched your newsletter in 1994 you had to manually remove defunct email addresses and stuff like that flash forward to today what the, you, you get some people on one side who say who vigorously clean their list who are anybody who's not like opening their emails within 30 days or clicking on something within 30 days removing th those people because they say it helps with deliverability um uh and then you have people on the other end of the spectrum who do no list cleaning whatsoever you, as someone who's watched this space for a long time what do you think the importance of list hygiene is i, I think it's pretty important and when I started in 94, there was no such thing as email service providers. So, you know, I was learning SendMail and Unix in order to get my stuff out. Um, but yeah, anytime I had bounces, you know, it was it was a manual process of figuring out what mail was bouncing. So I got into list hygiene pretty early and I worked with one of the first guys that ever did anything about bounce processing. Uh, back in the 90s. And so I would give him examples of things that I had trouble with. And that's partly how we got to the to the place of every different recipient getting their own um, message ID that not only identified who they were, but what newsletter are we talking about here? What exact issue? And um, so when Lyris came along, they were the first actual email service provider. Uh, he was consulting with them and, and uh, he brought me in to help exercise their software because they had, they just didn't have any big lists. And they said, oh yeah, we'd, we'd love a big list. How big is it? You know, I was like, <laughs> well, it's 150,000. And I was like, uh, we'll get back to you. We need to upgrade hardware first. So I do think that, that having a pretty clean list is good for for deliverability. Right now, I think probably half of my subscriber list, maybe even more, is on Gmail. And if Gmail gets a big slew of newsletters that are addressed to addresses that don't exist anymore, 
they haven't been opening it for six months, if they do exist, whatever, they're going to kind of mark you down over time. Yeah. So yes, I'm, I'm pretty good at looking at my open rates and, you know, open rates aren't perfect. Yeah. There are ways of reading newsletters without getting an open on your, uh, on your email. Um, but if I, I figure if, you know, they're, they're not clicking anything in, you know, three to six months, they're not really paying attention. They're not really engaged. I get rid of them. Yeah, I'm I'm definitely incorporating clicks into my uh, list cleaning. Like the the open like zero clicks is a good over six months is a good indication that they probably aren't going aren't really oper, you know aren't really engaged with your newsletter. Um, open rates are obviously distorted now. Now that iOS updated its system so that it's opening all emails, so it's it's something that's getting a little bit more difficult. Judd, I know you and I operate on Substack, which doesn't have have as great as list segmenting as some more robust plat robust systems plus substack is completely free so you have like some people they clean their list just because they they get charged more the bigger their list is so that incentivizes them to clean their list do you do any list cleaning or do you just not worry about it substack's not exactly free <laughs> once you start getting yeah. paid subscribers they charge quite a bit but, but it's not, uh, it's not, they don't charge based on the size of your list. Correct. Correct. Yeah. They charge based on your, on 10% of your revenue. Um, so no, I don't do anything in particular. I think they do some stuff in the background. Um, you know, I, and I also, I'm not sure how it works, but I think it's likely that whatever score I have, you know, by the ISPs is influenced by all of Substacks mailing practices rather than just my list. Yeah. So I think the cost benefit is a little bit different there because I am worried about, you know, just people who, for whatever reason, are are on a system that's not recording the opens. Um, mm -hmm. I actually use, you know, just in my own, uh, you know, when I'm contacting uh, people for comment and things like that, like I use like a little uh, service that puts a pixel in so that you can see like when they open it. And I know that like, sometimes like it doesn't, the pixel doesn't trigger, but you get a response from that person. So clearly yeah. they did open the email. So I don't think it's a perfect, I don't think it's a perfect, um, you know, mechanism. Yeah. Uh, so, um, I, so I don't, I don't take anything. I don't do any, anything other than whatever Substack is doing. Yeah. Um, Nick, I'm definitely going to get to your question when we get into monetization, but since just to stay on a little bit on topic, Margie, you had a question about how to actually in, uh, in, like identify unengaged people because of the iOS changes. What are some of the problems you're running into? So I work for author Jeff Salingo, and we have a newsletter that we send twice a month from HubSpot, and we've been trying to be really careful about the list, and we're not mailing to what HubSpot considers unengaged subscribers, but I really think we're starting to do ourselves a disservice, because I think um, my latest calculation, I would say at least 10% of the unengaged people, I think, are unengaged. We send them re-engagement emails, and even though there's no indication they open, they're doing things like using the manage preferences link that we offer to actually subscribe to some of our other newsletters. So I'm just seeing examples in a number of areas that HubSpot's data in that area is inaccurate, but I'm worried about you know, the penalty we'll get if we email too often to the people they consider unengaged, but a big chunk of the people are actually engaged. Yeah, Ernie, what do you think about it? Obviously, you're not a HubSpot expert, but in terms of thinking about engagement with newsletters, how to re-engage them, and try, and now that the 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 whole ecosystem is becoming more opaque with the data becoming less reliable, what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, it's 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 all really tough. I I will say I will say one thing is that you know with Apple's changes like. You know, it's kind of screwed up open rate for everybody, you know, obviously, but I, I think that I think that one, you know, one thing I would keep in mind is that, you know, the re-engagement approach is probably is probably a pretty good one. Um, and I think that it's something that a lot of, you know, a, a lot of people should do, like, especially if their list is a little bit on the, on the older side. Um, the other thing I, I wanted to sort of point out, and this is this is a related topic, but it's not like a hundred percent the same, 
you know, the same thing, which is, you know, I often run into problems where like, you know, I get, I, I get like drive by signups onto my website that are, you know, clearly spam and mm. you know, managing that has been, has been a big challenge. So, I mean, you know, I would say take a look at both, you know, how people are responding to the emails, but also what's coming in. Like, you know, if you see, if you see like, you know, 15 emails sign up and they all have really spammy looking addresses, like you have, you, you have more, more than one problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's something I'm thinking about a lot as, you know, Substack gets a little bit more lax in terms of the opt-in and stuff like that, especially with, um, with the recommendations feature where I'm just getting hundreds and hundreds of signups and it's hard to tell what's good versus not. So I've definitely gotten more vigilant in terms of my way now is like at, at the start of every month, I look at accounts that are over, over six months old that haven't clicked on a single link or opened a single email. And I'm probably missing out a lot of unengaged, but that, that at least gets out, you know, cleans out the least engaged. Jeff, you, you mentioned have, you know, having to do with like, you know, Gmail is kind of the 800 pound grill in the, in the room um, uh, in terms of it being the largest email service provider. And you've noticed some, some things to do with like list cleaning and getting from the promotions tab to the, the main inbox. Yeah. There's like a few factors. You can hear me. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, yeah, there's a few factors, at least on on our end. I assume it's probably similar for for a lot of people. One is that by cleaning the list um, every so often, doing sort of a unsubscribe unsubscribe sequence, um, we tend to get put back into updates instead of uh, the promotions tab. Which I don't know how much it differs for other people, but we see like a five to eight percent bump in open rates. Oh wow. Um, uh, another one is uh, we do find like after running a lot of paid acquisition, we get um, put in promotions sometimes. And then once we stop that, uh, like to acquire email addresses, once we stop that, we get back into updates sometimes. So it's, I, I, you know, it's kind of a, <laughs> there's no real, uh, you know, proven thing, I think, but that's been a few things that we've seen. Yeah. I've kind of stopped worrying about the promotions versus regular inbox. I figure if my readers really want to um, actually read my newsletter that they'll, they've learned by now how to manage their own inboxes. And I just have to hope that they're uh, finding my stuff uh, accordingly. Obviously I'm, I don't want to be in the spam folder, but um, yeah, it's just something that I don't spend a lot of time thinking about. I want to switch over and talk a little bit about monetization and Nick, you had a good question that I was going to ask myself. And I think Pat, I think Patrick would be, um, you know, a good person to, to maybe answer your question. Uh, what, go ahead and ask it. You're on mute. Oh, yes. Um, so we are a business to business finance company, and it's really our goal to increase our newsletter. I mean, we're looking to venture out into partnerships. How do we find these people to, to partner with? And be do we how do we offer it? Do we offer fifty percent um, of our article on their site? That's a clickable link back to us. Do we somehow sponsor it? Do they pay us, or how does that process work? Yeah, Patrick, you're part of the uh, like a referral program that through like Spark Loop or one of the or is it Swap Stack or one of those that you participate in. Um, yeah, I'd say we participate in a lot of the the different networks out there. Um, Nick, I didn't catch all of your question nor the, the name. He was just at, he was just asking when you're approaching another newsletter to try or another media company to try to partner with, like, what should you actually offer in terms of, should you offer them actual free content to run in their newsletter or, or half of an article to run in their newsletter? Like, how should you think about like what you're pitching them that has value? If the end goal is to drive uh, sponsors for your newsletter or type it, of sounds, it sounds like he's just trying to drive audience to so drive subscribers yes. to his newsletter gotcha. yes yeah i'd say we've had a lot of success over really the last three years partnering with other newsletters that have it honestly doesn't even need to be similar type uh, of content um we're in place of an ad in our newsletter uh, we did this more in the early days where we will just make a bona fide recommendation to another newsletter that we read. The other newsletter will do the same thing for, for us at the Daily Upside. And um, it's we found that uh, someone who reads one newsletter is much more likely to read another newsletter 
irrespective of um, really content overlap. So we have partnerships with marketing newsletters, um, with tech newsletters, really with all, all different types. And we find that when they come to the daily upside, they're still baseline engagement is significantly higher than folks that we get from other types of channels. So there is something about partnering with newsletters specifically that is, has been really valuable for us. Um, we do participate in some of the, call, call it newer type co-reg networks. Um, we were participating and, and do participate on, on Spark Loops Upscribe network. Um, I think it's a, a great idea and uh, helps folks that are not on a Substack or a Beehive that have these networks kind of in-house benefit from the same type of uh, network effect. Um, yeah, and... And Nick, just to translate what Patrick is saying, I don't know how familiar you are with Swapstack or Paved or Sparkloop, but there are these affiliate networks that you can create where you you put in how much you would be willing to pay per subscriber that that they convert, whether it's one dollar subscriber or three dollar mm -hmm. subscriber, and then any newsletter creator who thinks that their audience is aligned with yours, they can just go and grab your affiliate link and then write a a, um, a recommendation for your newsletter, and then you only pay them based on how many subscribers they send you so it can be very efficient especially if you're kind of optimizing uh your spend uh judd i know you have a hard stop in like five to ten minutes i want i just want to talk very briefly about your monetization approach in the in the sense of like you did something you know part way through running your newsletter where you completely removed your paywall and yet still considered to could continue to see a large increase in paying subscribers and i want i was Hoping maybe to just hear a little bit of your thoughts on like what kind of creators do you think that would work for and what kind of how do they need to change up their messaging in order to get people to pay for stuff that they're getting for free? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I actually oh I am I'm not on mute. Yeah. Uh, I actually think it would work for quite a few people. I mean, obviously there's a category of business intelligence newsletters where there's a very clear, you know, kind of return on investment, you know, you pay $20 a month, you're going to get this valuable information about stocks, and you'll make some trades off there and it'll more than pay for itself. And there's other types of newsletters, stuff about China and, and different stuff involving investing where that applies. But I think in most cases, people don't really need as far as it's not really a money making opportunity for them. And uh, there are plenty of people who do well with paywalls, but I think for the most, for a lot of folks, they're reading these newsletters and they're invested in the topics you are covering and they believe in the kind of content you're producing. Mm -hmm. So I think, and, and that's a lot of why we buy anything, right? That's why we buy brands. That's why we buy the clothes that we buy. It's about what does it say about you? And so I think tapping into that uh, and talking about what are the values that underlie your work in the newsletter and asking people if they believe in this mission, if they believe in these values to support you has been effective for me. I, I kind of just lucked into it because at the start of the pandemic, just based on the topics that I was covering, which was a lot about you know workers who lacked paid sick leave and things like that. I just didn't feel right about saying, oh, well, you could learn about these workers who are being exploited if you pay me you know, X amount of money. It just felt like at that point, I wanted to take it down for a while. And I said, I'm going to keep it down for the length of the pandemic. Well, it, I didn't realize at the time that was going to be quite a while and it's still going. Uh, but what I found was actually the number of people, when I switched to that messaging, the number of people who are signing up for paid subscribers increased. Yeah. And so you get that benefit. The other benefit is every single time you send your email, one, it can get sent out, it can get circulated in the full universe of people, including people who aren't subscribed to your newsletter, which is always going to be a larger universe. And so then you're you're hitting people and getting people to know about what you're doing that otherwise wouldn't. And then secondly, since you're hitting your whole list uh, every time uh, you get more opportunities to sort of 
pitch people of so why they should support it. So yeah. I think the combination of those factors um, it has really you know worked out well. And uh, you do a good job of um, communicating impact. Like you do a lot of investigative journalism. And so when you like, for instance, after the January 6th uh, riots, uh, um, the you know the the attack on the Capitol, you got a lot of companies to pull their their donations to GOP candidates who supported uh, the big lie. And every time a major corporation pulled their um, their funding for those candidates, you reminded your audience that you were the one who called attention to it. Which and then that was able. You were then able to make a pitch for people to become subscribers, saying, "Look, I get results, and this is why you should." pay for my newsletter, even though you're not getting something that's yeah. behind a paywall. And that was, that was a very effective message. Um, of course, it's hard, you know, you can't just count on having a, a big story that, that is reverberated around other outlets and things like that every single day. Um, and so what I've, what I've really found is I spend a lot of time thinking about those messaging and I don't, Substack really doesn't have a way to AB test, but it's sort of like each each issue is kind of a test. And so yeah. even very effective messages, what I found will degrade over time. Uh, and they'll also degrade day by day. So I never use the same one two days in a row for the most part. And then, but I'll keep the ones that do well and then I'll cycle them back in yeah. um, when it's appropriate. And so I'm always, you know, it's really part of my process is sort of thinking about, okay, here's what I'm writing today. And then as I'm kind of getting towards completion, I'll start thinking about, well, how, what is the, for the free subscribers, what's my message about, you know, this, it doesn't always have to be connected to your newsletter. It could have been, yeah. a, you know, could be sort of an update of a previous newsletter it could be sort of more of a, you know, it actually helps as I was sort of alluding to, you can't really count on, you know, breaking news or, or having some big impact. So I need some more generic, you know, messages about what we're about. And in fact, one of the messages that has worked the best, the most consistently is, hey, I'm not putting anything behind a paywall. And I'm doing that because I don't think that this, you know, it was kind of going back to my original rationale. I don't think this information should be limited based on the ability to pay. But you know, the old, this is a subscriber supported newsletter. So the only way I can keep doing this, the only way that this works is for people that volunteer, who can afford it, who voluntarily choose to support it. And so if you do value it and you can afford it, you know, please pay up. And yeah. that's actually a pretty, you know, that variations on that message. And, you know, I've had to alter it too, because I can't really say, you know, at this point, I can't really say, um, you know, I'm going to go out of business if you don't subscribe. But it was actually true when I started and I had yeah. no income. Uh, but, um, you know, now I talk about it and I've, I've been able to hire, I have two full-time staff people now. And I tell people, hey, look, you know, if we get more, a uh, higher percentage of people subscribing, we can do more. We can have more people. We can invest in more strategies. We can get out on more social networks. I, I sort of, I started, a, I, I hired someone to create TikTok videos for me that way. So you know, kind yeah. of just iterating that message and and making it authentic and matching it up with where you are. So something that was effective in 2019 is not going to be effective today. And the messages that I'm using today aren't going to be effective, you know, six months from now. And I'll just keep kind of iterating. Yeah. And I know you have to go soon, but Bo yeah. Bruskern had a quick uh, question in the chat about uh, the percentage of your free list that converts to paid. I think, you know, uh, the standard highly successful newsletter converts like three to 5%. Does that sound about right? Uh, I, I have about 8% is, is what I'm at. Um, and that actually is down a bit. I had it close. I had it into the nines, close to 10. Um, Substack's recommendation feature is probably the best reason to be on Substack versus another platform. It's really increased the growth of my free list, uh, accounts for the majority of my growth now on the free list side they're a little bit harder to convert. Yeah. Which is why my conversion has gone down. But I mean, and some people are sort of upset about that, but for me, I'm just like, Hey, uh, you know, I wasn't getting these people before. And yes, they're not, it's not someone who came specifically for me. They signed up for another newsletter and then we're told that that newsletter recommended me. So it's going to take a little more time to kind of get them 
uh, on board. But um, yeah, I do think it's I do think it's possible to get you know above the the three to five percent, especially if you kind of keep going at it. You know, there are people. It, it's I hear from a lot of people who are who are like, hey, just want to let you know, I finally subscribed to your newsletter. I've been meaning to do it for you know three months. And then I really like this one and I did, you know, so you yeah. don't, you know, it's like, that's, it's not going to be, it's, it's, it's sometimes is the priority for you, obviously, because you're trying to run a newsletter and make some money. And so for you, Hey, every day, the most important thing is people should sign up for my newsletter, but for the people reading, it's one of a, of a million things in their inbox. They may like it, but it, it can take them some time. So, and Matt, and Matt asked in the, ch in the chat, how much you charge? I charge um, six dollars a month or fifty dollars a year, and I very yeah. intentionally push people to the yearly because yeah. one, it's almost as much just raw money, not even counting the churn, because you're paying that like thirty cents to Stripe every single time, which adds up over a year, yeah. and then because they have that flat fee in addition to their percentage fee, and then also just the churn of a monthly it's much better. You get much more consistency in your income with the, with the yearly. So I, I really, that's like my number one advice to people when I'm talking to people who start off on some second, actually, that's what I'm ready to is I'm going to have coffee with somebody who's thinking of starting yeah. a newsletter. So I'm going to continue my newsletter discussion, but um, you know, uh, pushing people to yearly subs versus monthly, I think is a kind of creates a lot of consistency for you as like the business owner and is just sort of better for everyone. You also get that whole year to demonstrate the value. So yeah. in a month, maybe you did really hit something that that person connected to for whatever. Cause you know, I like for the last month I've been doing ton on Florida and classroom libraries and, you know, library books. Yeah. A lot of people are really into it. There's probably some portion of my audience who's like, Judd, stop writing about this because I'm I don't care. You know, yeah. I, I don't care about this particular issue. But hopefully, you know, in the course of the next 11 months, I'll get to something that they do care about. And when they come time to renew, they'll think, oh yeah, I really liked, you know, this topic and that topic. So yeah. Cool. Well, Judd, yeah. I know you have a hard yeah. stop. I got to go to I got to run, but thanks so much for having me. This was great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for coming. So like a few things he touched on, there was one thing he said that I really spoke to me in the sense of advice that I give to creators is don't just copy and paste the same call to action every single time. Um, I always write my calls to actions from scratch every single time, usually trying to tailor it to whatever I'm writing in that newsletter. I think two people get into, too many people get in the habit of just copying and pasting the, you know, please subscribe to support me messaging and people just learn to just block it out like it becomes like ad blindness whereas if you're constantly switching things up then they're actually going to read the message because it's something interesting and new that they haven't seen before randy you um you uh, monet you were one of the first newsletters you did a lot of first and one of the things you did before there were even paypal existed you had to figure out how to to collect subscriptions and payments and stuff uh from people you know flash forward to today what do you see as being like the driver of conversions for your newsletter from the people who are on the free list to the to the paid list how do you communicate that value proposition like you i i write my pitch fresh every week um, I, i'm a weekly and i find different things resonate you know it, it just it kind of depends and i can't give you a formula for that um, i will try all sorts of things um, from you know this is what makes the publication possible in the first place to do you want more stuff like this so it, it's really difficult um somebody said in the, in the comments they thought one uh, percent conversion is a, is probably a rule I think that's a pretty old rule uh, with with real big circulation things. If you got one percent, you're really making some money. These days, when it's really hard to get even a free subscriber, I think one percent is just not enough. I'm actually at about twelve and a half right now. Oh wow! So it's yeah. So one percent? No, I'd, I'd really be working on on building that a lot higher. Yeah. And the 1%, as you said, that's more kind of like general for like, you know, 
national and local newspapers. And that's not just the newsletter list. I think there's that's their total audience, like people who are landing on their website and people who are just landing on their website are going to convert at much lower rates. Yeah, I agree that, that any newsletter list should it should be a higher percentage than one percent for conversions um but if you have a site that had like you know like tagan's site political wire i'm sure his conversion rate is much smaller but it's because he just has a really huge um a really huge audience on his website am i guessing correctly tagan um yeah i mean i i have you know like you know somewhere around four to six million readers a month so um you know, it, you know, I don't need a large percentage of those to convert to may have a very good business. Yeah. Um, I want to switch to uh, advertising. We haven't talked about that. Um, first of all, I'll call him Patrick and then Ernie. Patrick, how do you like for newsletter advertising? What's the way that you're finding advertisers and how are you pitching the value proposition of a newsletter versus, you know, a website ad or a YouTube ad or something like that? Like, how, how are you communicating with, with advertisers or potential advertisers? Yeah, great question. I'd say it's pretty challenging to you know, be someone's first newsletter that they advertise on. I'd say if there are folks interested in, you know, adding advertising to their newsletter, it's the number one tactic I'd recommend is looking to see who's advertising on other newsletters that look like yours. Yeah. And there's a product called Who Sponsors Stuff. It's kind of expensive. It's like $6,000 a year, but it actually creates an entire database that looks at who's, who's sponsoring other newsletters. Keep going. Yeah. So something like that can pay for itself very quickly um so we have an inbox of you know hundreds of other newsletters that we look at and if we see a sponsor that we think would do well on the daily upside you know, we have a pretty um you know practiced approach to go reach out to who we think the right person is at those types of companies and then if we're looking to convert someone new to newsletter advertising it's generally going to be a much longer process um where we'll you know support the merits of newsletter advertising in general, but also the merits of our audience, um, you know, portray results of similar sponsors that have run in the past. Um, but a sales cycle like that could easily take three, six, nine months. So it's, it's a much, you know, much more challenging activity. Yeah. I found that most of my sponsors are um, direct sales type of people who are looking to put in a tracking link and they're not necessarily selling a product. A lot of them are selling a service. So there's a, there's a longer lead cycle, but they do want to track that conversion. Is is that where you see the market is right now? Mostly. Um, I'd say it's, it's a, it's a good mix. I mean, newsletters are a conversion oriented channel. So yeah, I think there's a lot of folks performance oriented marketers who look at newsletters as as an effective channel. Um, I'd say for us, we are definitely looking to break into more brand oriented and uh, sponsorship in our newsletter as we scale. Um, So yeah, I'd say it's it's a good mix. Yeah. Ernie, you're one of the only creators on this, feature creators on this call who doesn't run your newsletter as a full-time operation, but you do that on purpose. You've said to me, you like the creative freedom of not having to worry about it being your full-time job because then you would have, it it would take the fun out of it, but you do monetize your newsletter a little bit. It seems like from what I can tell that you are like pulling a lot from these networks like paved and swap stack. And what's your, what's kind of your approach there and how, how I, I I've been invited into these programs, but I've never participated because, well, first, can you just explain what these platforms are and how they work? And then also how effective are they at driving revenue? Um, What I would say with, with these platforms and I've tried a few strategies with them, um, you know, paved is a more programmatic approach. You can actually, uh, you you can actually set it up so that, you know, you can build a template for for your newsletter. And um, I I don't know how familiar everybody is with my newsletter, but I do everything custom as far as design goes. So that's very appealing to me. Um, the other thing, the other thing is uh, with uh, with Slopstack, they actually. Uh, it, it's more of a an affiliate model, and that you can actually, uh, you know, do you know, work with sponsors without having to have like a direct relationship with them. And part of the reason why this appeals to me 
leaves a little money on the table, I will admit. But like part of the reason this does appeal to me is that, you know, I don't, you know, I'm not doing this full time. So as a result, I want to be able to like, you know, have advertising, but not necessarily have to manage all the ad relationships, which can get very uh, time consuming and a lot of back and forth and such. But the, you know, the other thing I would say about these services is it's, they're really good for backfill, which is basically to say, if you, if you are in a position where you're not necessarily running a lot, you know, you, you have gaps, like in the slow time of the year, for example, like, it's really great to be able to put them in and, you know, just, just try different things. And, you know, because there are so many different types of, you know, of advertisers on there, you know, a lot of products, a lot of other newsletters. Um, I see, I see that Jacob is on here. He, he's done, he's done a little bit with TDM. Um, you know, I think that one of the things, one of the things I'll say is, you know, be willing to try different approaches, you know, with this stuff, you know, you, you can try things that are like focused on the subject matter. You can try things that are more, more like, okay, well, I'll just do this one sponsor for a month and like see how, you know, different messaging can work with that. You know, experimentation, I would say, is a good approach if like you're not doing a lot of like direct advertiser relationships. Yeah. And so the way that these work is you just grow and you on swap stack, you grab an affiliate link and then you plug it in your newsletter. Like, are you like really like looking for newsletters that really align with your audience? I try to, although I will say that, you know, in a, in a lot of cases, you know, sometimes it helps to, you know, try something that's a little, that's a little just, uh, you know, interesting, not necessarily like having like a straight, like, you know, having like a, you know, a hard fit with, uh, you know, your subject matter. I mean, in, in my case, like I read a lot of really weird stuff. So like I can often like pick and choose things based on uh, what, you know, what makes sense with that particular issue. But you know, I think that plenty of options. Mm -hmm. Okay. I want to recognize that we've come up on the hour. I always know that some people only really block out an hour for this. So, um, so I want to recognize that it won't be offended if you have to jump off. I also want to thank, you know, all my featured guests. I know that I asked you to block out an hour, so I won't be offended if you have to leave, but uh, as always, I'm always happy to stay on a little bit longer to talk to people and hear about what issues they're having and stuff like that. And maybe me or any other guests that are on could, you know, talk to them as well. Um, okay. We have lots of people falling off. I did have uh, a question for one person, but uh, Bill Murphy, you're on here. You have like a really popular newsletter, right? Did we lose oh, one? Hey there. Hey, <laughs> it's funny. <Yeah. laughs> Sorry. I had to, uh, I had to run out for a minute. So I missed a little bit of this, but I happened to just walk back in just as yeah. you called on me. So I don't know what we're talking about. Sorry. <laughs> no, I'm just, we're just kind of, since we're at the end of the hour, some like people are just kind of dropping off, but I just wanted to spend an extra few minutes, you know, on here answering people's questions or people, other people wanted to just talk about their own experiences with newsletters. You seem you, I saw you popping into the track, the chat, you have like a really popular newsletter on Substack, but it seems like maybe you're having some doubts about whether Substack is the best, uh, platform or not to stick with? Well, I think, um, you know, I do, a, I always say that I made every possible mistake in launching mine. It's daily. It's very broad. Um, and, uh, you know, the positive side is probably that I think most of my readers, I mean, I write about different things every day, but most of my, and it's daily, uh, but most of my readers are following me personally, which is kind of cool. Um, but it's also, you know, the, I've, I've, I've called it the NPR model, like I'm nowhere near 8%. I mean, I, I don't know if I want to say exactly. It's, you know, it's enough that my wife isn't like, what's your, <laughs> what, what are you doing <laughs> when, with this? But, when, um, when are you getting a job? When are you getting a real job? Yeah, but basically, so to, to the extent I think of other platforms, it's either because I do want to launch a second one. Now I've got this a little bit closer to just down to a, um, a science, but with some of the things I've learned. But I also think like revenue diversification is is very important. And I do run ads but I find it difficult to run ads because Substack is very anti-ads from a philosophical perspective. So, um, so yeah, so I'm just looking at other options. Yeah. Um, I know that people like Andy or Ernie and Randy, uh, I, especially Ernie is kind of anti Substack because he is so design focused and loves to customize, 
you know, his things. I just, I just, I'm someone who just loves the out of the box feature of it. So I can focus as much on the content as possible. And I don't mind just doing the writing these custom ads and stuff like that. Um, I don't know, Ernie, he has like a huge list uh, that would get pretty expensive if he was using MailChimp or something. Do, do you think the uh, Substack should be the place he stays at? You know, it's, it's, it's really interesting. I think that like, you know, I honestly think that in many ways, if if like your goal is to just like run this thing as a business and like ensure that like the you know all the flows work, you know maybe Substack still makes sense for you. I mean, I I do think though that that Ghost in particular is a pretty is a pretty solid choice if like you want a little bit more control, but like you also feel like there's there are weaknesses with the Substack model for for your use case. Um, I think you know I I don't necessarily recommend my approach to people, which is which is just sort of like make it so custom that like uh, you know if I you know if, if you know, hand if, code everything. <laughs> yes, yeah, hand code everything. You know that's I I don't necessarily recommend that for for most people, but I'm a special case. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Randy, was that you? That was. Yeah. I was, I, I read Ernie's stuff and, and it seems like everything is completely hand coded, which really makes it look nice. Yeah. But his, his boy, newsletter I does want to look spend very that well designed. Yeah. yeah. What what do you use, Randy? Uh, I use Aweber and I have uh, uh, some custom uh, templating software that, that formats it for Aweber. And um, my paid list, it goes out on a completely custom platform. Yeah. Jennifer, you run a, uh, a feminist magazine, but I'm sure you have a robust newsletter uh, uh, presence. What what kind of issues are you thinking about as regards to newsletters? Like, and are, do you feel like you're, you're using All them? Of them. <laughs> All of them. Um, on, the, on the platform side, I'll just say that we're about to start using Newsletter Blue. Uh, and creating the newsletters inside of WordPress, as opposed to we use Mailchimp as the ESP. Um, but we're mm. going to start to experiment a little bit with using Newsletter Glue, which is this WordPress plugin. Uh, which I, I hate Mailchimp to with the fire of a thousand suns. <laughs> um, but I also, Ernie, I'm with you on the Substack thing, so I won't go there for us. Um, so I'm hoping Newsletter Glue helps us with some of the design aspects. I, I want it to look and feel a lot more like our site rather than a MailChimp template. Um, yeah. I feel really constrained by that. Ghost has been appealing. What am I looking to do? We're, it's so funny. We just had a meeting about newsletters this morning. Um, we're going to ramp it up. We're really ramping it up in terms of frequency, launching new newsletter products, um, we're doing a big editorial package around death. Isn't that cheery? Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm going to try to sell in to all of the death tech companies our, the, a newsletter series associated with that reporting series. We're going to test and play and see what happens. I think my biggest struggle is conversions and to pay, right? We're not a creator. We're not Judd and I you know, I hail him. He's amazing. One of my heroes in this industry. I fear for outlets like Dame, we straddle this weird messaging of conversion. Like, are you supporting the site? Are you supporting our newsletter products? The thing that has helped the most, and we've talked about this before, is when I started to write an intro to our newsletters. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I got a comment the other day on Twitter uh, to the damn Twitter that somebody said, you know, they, they took a pull quote out of my intro and said, thank you, Dame Magazine for this. And, and we thanked them back and they said, this is why I'm a paying member. Uh, that came from our intro that I write, not a story. So my, my biggest challenge is how do I walk, how do we walk this weird line of not being an individual creator that tends to get the 300,000, you know, paid and non-paid members as subscribers with also being an outlet, right? It, that's, uh, you know, I would kill for an 8% uh, 
conversion rate. Today. Yeah. So yeah. That's our biggest challenge right now. That's interesting what you say though about like the person adding the personal note at the beginning of the newsletter. Like it changed you know. our, our open rates, you know, not notwithstanding what we're learning about the how meaningful open rates are right now, but change them. We went up 10 points. Yeah. Wow. Um Matt was asking about the downsides of MailChimp. I would say, you know, as Ernie was saying, it's something that like is like it's got every bell and whistle. And I think a lot of editorial creators, they don't need that level of sophistication. And so that can just create some more confusion than you actually need. Also, it doesn't have a great web presence. So it's like, you know, with Substack, it just has like a really beautiful blog like web presence, whereas MailChimp looks like crap on the web. What else, Jennifer, don't you like about MailChimp? I mean, it's a commerce play. Yeah. It's great. If I were in the commerce business, I'd be thrilled. But I, the interface thing is, the it, for me, it's the major thing around having it look beautiful in a browser. I want that thing to render as well as one of our articles does. And so that's what I'm hoping. I'll come back to everybody and let you know how the experience with the newsletter glue you know, ends up being. I also am going to be tracking... What does that do for our SEO and traffic just generally? Can we move people if the if the newsletter itself, the archive lives on our site versus inside of MailChimp? MailChimp yeah. doesn't need my traffic. I need my traffic. Yeah. Right. So we'll we'll see how that changes things a little bit. Yeah, and I, that was something I wanted to dive into. Ernie and maybe Randy can speak to this. Like a lot of newsletter creators kind of downplay SEO as important. Uh, but I think, you know, for certain articles, like you could, like newsletter issues, you could actually drive a lot of conversions long term as you build up your archives. Ernie, your stuff does pretty well because you write about esoteric, you know, stuff that there isn't a lot of, a lot of it other information about do you see a lot of conversions coming in through seo yeah i mean i i think that in general like that that approach has worked very well like i have a post from i have a post from 2016 that still that still sees like 100 plus visits a day and it's you know it and it's about like weird phone numbers or whatever and obviously that you know obviously you have to like find those things and make it make sense for for what you do I also think that it, as well, like having, you know, having this stuff on like a website that's like, de you know, that's like built for like being a website rather than a newsletter platform that just distributes your newsletter. Yeah. It has, it has a lot of benefits. Like we actually had a post back in uh, November or so. It wasn't written by me, uh, unfortunately, but the, the guy who wrote it, uh, Chris Dallariva, like it's a data expert on like, on, on like the music industry and he like managed to like listen to every billboard number one hit and he like uncovered this like finding about how number one hits no longer have key changes and it like became this huge thing like you know like it was a super viral post and it would not have gotten anywhere near the level of attention it got if like we if you didn't have a chip. Yeah, if you didn't have a robust MailChimp uh, presence, do people coming into that like that uh, weird phone number post are they converting into subscribers or? Yes, yeah, so some of them are. I mean, like I, I would say that like you're not like finding like you know people some people you know who are like looking at weird phone numbers are not necessarily looking for that specifically, but like you know we trend for all sorts of weird things like i think that we're like on the first page for bob vila for some reason and <laughs> <laughs> you know i but but that but that said you know like if if one of those people convert and one another converts on like another term that's that we're like high on for search like that's you know that's a pretty you know that's a pretty solid strategy even if like not everybody looking for that information is just like oh i want to take a look at this this newsletter again you know yeah Randy, you have pretty huge archives stretching back pretty far. How important is SEO to you in terms of your business? I always thought that the, you know, the proverbial long tail would bring a lot of traffic. And I find that's not really true. Um, there are certain pages of mine. Uh, there was two different guys in Florida. You know, I like the rag on Florida man who literally shot at passing motorists through their own windshields. And those two guys really became, you know, legendary 
anti-heroes and people are actually looking for those people's names and I get a lot of traffic from that but it's just really hit and miss as it were yeah so even with this big do you prioritize SEO like do you try to optimize for it no oh, okay interesting uh Substack just uh, Substack has been kind of ragged as not being good for SEO but they actually just pu published a um article today uh, talking about all the improvements they've made to, you know, how they're indexed. And they even allow you to write SEO headlines within the CMS now. Um, so they're, they're, it's definitely something that they're, they've heard criticism for and that they're, um, they're optimizing for. Uh, what else? Anybody else have any questions before we sign off for the day? This is a, this is the best time to bring it up. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. This is one of our most well-attended office hours. Uh, we had some amazing insights uh, shared by our guest. I want to thank them again. And uh, yeah, we got more and more of these coming up. Uh, one of our upcoming guests is going to be Dan Ochinski. He couldn't make today, but we're going to, he's, he's so, uh, he's so experienced on this topic around newsletters that we're going to center an entire office hours uh, around him. So um, look for that to be the announcement for that to come in your inbox and we have lots of other um great uh office hours coming up we're going to be we're going to have one coming up i think you know matt you haven't received I, I haven't emailed you but i'm definitely going uh to reach out to you for this was uh but how to become a professional ghostwriter um i have several people i know including matt who make a full-time living uh through that i want to do something on like self-publishing books i know i have several subscribers who have thriving careers using like amazon's uh kindle publishing there's just like a lot of interesting uh topics coming up within the next few months so i hope to see uh everybody soon so i'm going to go ahead and stop this recording um if you